All right. Well, thank you, Brett, for that introduction. And, and Brett is, is going to be humble, as, as a lot of our USDA scientists will, including Dave. This is an awesome lineup of speakers, and I'm not self-aggrandizing here saying because I'm here. It's because I get to work with these guys. I think what's going to be really great about this meeting is it's going to be rooted in, in a lot of data, objective, unemotional data. My opening up this meeting is uh, I get to provide some more anecdotes. As they mentioned, I'm an extension chief specialist for the University of Wyoming. And as part of my position, I have teaching, research, and extension responsibilities. So I still have the pleasure of working with my producers in the state of Wyoming. Uh, the research that I do has to be in line with their needs. And the classes that I teach are also uh, closely connected there. And so I guess what I'm trying to say is my perspective is probably going to be a little bit more philosophical with some of the data that we've discovered. And it's going to be in the context of working in the commercial sheep industry. But before I do that, my disclaimer is this. I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I, I hail from Western New York originally on a cow calf and a ewe lamb operation. I've been West since 2007 uh, for all my school and education. And, and my family originally is from Utah. I like 90s country music. You may think that is uh, an, ab an abstract thought for this meeting, but I think it's it's a good disclaimer. So one of those artists that I like is Sammy Kershaw, and he's got a song that's called, uh, well, an album that's Politics, Religion, and Her. And he, basically the song says, there's three things we don't talk about, okay? Uh, and and this, is, this is the lyric, let's talk about baseball, talk a little small talk, there's gotta be a good joke that you've heard, let's talk about NASCAR, old Hollywood movie stars, let's talk about anything, anything in this whole world, but politics, religion, and her. And I would add today, in my realm, we could talk about politics. We don't want to talk about politics for sure. Definitely not religion. But <laughs> I found that talking about purebred sheep breeds is always a risky proposition. <laughs> okay? okay. Especially because of the show industry. And uh, there is always a lot of passion. And that's what I love about the sheep industry for the breeds that we produce. But oftentimes that passion, uh, the exhibition and competitiveness can be kind of a, a stumbling block for us, I think. And so I'm going to come at it from a lens that is very different. Brett mentioned this disclaimer earlier, but I want to reiterate that, that, that my personal interests are, are rooted in the Western sheep industry. That's where I work. Those are the people that I serve. And, and that's where I'm headed. But I'm very much a commercial sheep production guy. Growing up on our cow calf and ewe lamb operation, we service the ethnic market entirely out of the greater Buffalo area. So to us, it wasn't about a specific breed. It was about what was the best lamb that we could produce that could get to weight, that we could cash out of that lamb under the table to the ethnic market and keep our, our farm in the high tax region of Western New York. Uh, we failed, that farm has since been sold and I'm working in academia, so. <laughs> but uh, I'm also, again, I'm not aligned to a particular breed association. And I just wanna make that clear. And anything that I present today is through objective lenses. And that's one of the beauties that we have at the land grant institution today is that we are supposed to provide research-based information, even though I'm gonna give you some anecdotes today. Um, it's something to think about. By way of philosophy, I think perspective is important, right? You all have a unique perspective on your sheep enterprise that gauges and dictates why you do what you do, okay? I think it's important to understand and define what perspective is because it ultimately defines on how we view the world and how our narrative is shaped. I love this quote, to change ourselves effectively, we first had to change our perceptions. You may be thinking at, at a meeting of like-minded Katahdin breeders that this may be an echo chamber, okay? But what I wanna introduce is I wanna introduce the, the thought that there are opportunities for us to improve and capitalize on things that maybe we're not doing perfectly. And, and thereby, that, that's where strong organizations grow, in my opinion, is that we challenge those paradigms. So specifically, as I share the rest of my talk, and even the speakers that come, I want you to think about and jot down some notes that say, what is the goal of my operation? And that's something that we can't tell you what it should be. From a commercial and commodity style production system, I could tell you the criteria that make large range flocks work. But I think ultimately, what you go back and do and the changes you're going to make have to be unique to your operation, and they ultimately will be. And then what is the larger goal of the Katahdin breed in the U.S. West? And I think that's a really good uh, thing to think about because ultimately I assume that your goal is to expand Katahdin numbers in our region. Is that a correct assumption? You think they work, you know they work, that's your goal. And I think 
how are you going to differentiate your flock and how are you going to help achieve that larger goal of expanding the cotton breed in the U.S. West is something you should be thinking about as I go through my talk. So this right here just shows that things change a little bit. This right here is the U.S. sheep industry registrations is, is provided from the 1920 ag census and the banner registrations in 2020. Uh, those, those breeds highlighted in red, again, I didn't have exact numbers from that old 1920 ag census, but I highlighted the breeds in red that are still in the top eight. And then the, the breeds in black are those that have either disappeared from the top eight registrations or have now entered the top eight registrations. Now, I think this is really fascinating and you could argue that, well, some breeds weren't introduced until later. For example, the Suffolk probably gained some momentum uh, a little bit later than 1920, but what this should, and what I like to present this data as here is that things change. And the paradigms that we'd love to just be tied to, which are straight jackets to how we make decisions in the industry, uh, are oftentimes just anecdotes. They're personal opinions. And uh, I can't tell you how many times I hear from producers, oh, that, that breed just won't run in my country, okay? And, and I guess a good example of that is the Shropshire breed. And, and I, I, I always get a kick out of this. I had a, a, a developed kind of houses and was, was breeding them to his 2000 head of range use. And all I heard from producers in surrounding area, well, those Shropshire don't work in our country. Well, 1920, there was a lot of Shropshires in Wyoming, okay? So that, that is mostly to point to the fact that, that the Katahdin breed is working for some people in the state. Others have not tried it. Uh, but the reality is, is that, that times change and breeds can become pretty adaptable to the environments that they run in over time. The other thing that I'd like to point out, I think, is that if we were to do a poll of this room and say, how many of us come from uh, a one to 100 head category of sheep? And I'm not going to do that today. But I think uh, as you look at these operational sizes across Wyoming, Utah, and Idaho, there's just some realities that we have to acknowledge. In terms of sheer numbers of sheep producers, the greatest amount of sheep producers are in that one to 100 head category, okay? Can we all agree on that based off the ag census data? Good. Um, the other reality that I like to tout about Wyoming is that we still have a stronghold of 1,000 to 10,000 head operations in the range flocks. We have comparative to Idaho and Utah, 11% of all our sheep operations are in that larger category. But more so, what I think is most important is 41% of all the sheep produced in the US, all of the sheep produced, 41%, are greater than 1,000 head. That number ticks up to about 54% of all sheep produced in the US when you expand that range from a 300 head flock to a 5,000 head flock. I don't know how many thousand head flocks we have in here today, but I think uh, long term, making segues into those larger flocks, whether you're providing breeding stock to those flocks or uh, collaborating with larger research centers that are able to generate that critical mass of numbers and uh, population, that's really how we're going to expand the Katahdin breed into the range side of things. Historically, uh, this is recently published, we, we did an invited review article where we looked at some of the imperfect, and I say imperfect, USDA docking data in western states. How many of you are familiar with that sheep and goat report that they publish annually? Any of you mull it over a little bit? Yeah, it's interesting to me because that's how I justify to my administrators that I still have, should have a job. But uh, more so, I'd like to know what changes are happening in the state in our sheep industry. I'm a sheep nerd. I live and die in the sheep industry. And uh, this historic productivity data is imperfect because in our range states, a lot of the data that we attribute to you prolificacy or number of lambs born is really an imperfect docking percentage, okay? It's really for our large range flocks and especially some of our shed lambing flocks, the real first estimate of productivity, right or wrong, is at the docking percentage when we dock those lambs. And basically, you can see that those, those red triangles there kind of are the trend line across Colorado, Idaho, Montana, Utah, and Wyoming. We've been around 100% is what we're docking, okay? Now, when I see that data, it depresses me a little bit because we're raising a breed that produces, uh, it's a multiple bearing species, okay? Multiple in a litter. Um, there's opportunities, whether it be manage, management or genetics, that we should be improving that historic productivity. And I will argue that in Wyoming, where we have the majority of our numbers in the Western side of the state, in very big range lambing flocks that, that range lamb in May and June, 
We see a fluctuation in our productivity numbers from USDA simply because of, of spring storms to a large degree. If we have a bad cold uh, blizzard in May, our docking percentage is that, that year go down. But what this does show, even across the states, Idaho, uh, go Idaho, Dr. Ellison and, and Dr. Taylor, um, you guys are, are a little bit above that. But as I show you this historic productivity, I, I'm gonna offer this rhetorical question. How do you manage productivity in your flock? Are we keeping track of those just baseline measurements of how many lambs are, are we producing? How many pounds of lamb are we producing for you exposed? How many lambs are we weaning for you exposed? If I was to ask around the room, and I won't, because even our range guys, our large producers, some of them aren't getting that data. How do we know where we're gonna improve as a breed? Let alone in a commercial system, right? Our banker might be asking us those questions, but how are we ever gonna improve if we are not keep taking those measurements? And you're gonna hear from a lot of speakers today that are gonna present some hard, unemotional data about breed productivity. And I think is a good start to challenge yourself as an organization, because I'm projecting what your goals should be. Sorry, that's what happens when you bring in a, a university speaker. I think that you as a goal, as an organization should be tracking that progress. I think it's critical. Now, I throw up wool on the slide and this is where people are gonna say, you know, I don't know if I liked that Whit Stewart guy, okay? All right, so let's just, I'm gonna throw that out there. It's the elephant in the room. I'm in charge of our collegiate wool judging program. I do a lot of value added wool research at the University of Wyoming. I love wool, okay? But that does not mean I don't like hair sheep, all right? So let's throw that out there. But the talking point that I often hear the most is I hear wit, wool is just not worth anything, okay? If we are gonna be touting the, the strengths of our breed, we should be speaking in accurate terms, okay? There's a nice asterisk that we should say when we put wool is not worth anything in the conversation, okay? And I just wanna walk through some rough wool economic scenarios because it's important that we understand that in the Intermountain West, and in areas where we can produce a higher valued wool clip, wool still is an econo of economic importance. And I will show you why with hard and fast numbers. Now there's the emotional side where you say, well, finding shears is just such a headache. And that week that we shear is just such a headache, okay? And I, maybe in your operation it is. For others, that wool check comes at a very important time of the year from a cash flow perspective. The lambs have been sold in the, in the fall. That wool check in high years pays a lot of bills for producers in this region. And so if we are going to talk about the strengths of our breed, it is okay to say, you know what? I don't have to shear and that's fine. But we have to be careful that we don't say that wool is just not worth anything. And I'll show you why. So let's just take for a scenario, uh, an average based off of USDA broad aggregated data says that we produce roughly a nine pound fleece. That's pretty high in quality at 22 micron. And of that nine pound fleece, 54% is clean wool, okay? And this is a current price for 22 micron wool. We are down back to about 10 year ago prices. Four years ago, we were at historic highs, but I'm just giving you very contemporary estimates. So at that, we're grossing about $18.46 gross wool revenue per year. Is that what we take home? I gave it away, we're talking gross, so no. Uh, so there's the shearing costs. And I've inflated this value, okay? This may be more for small flocks. This is a lot more for our large flocks that are paying close to 375. But anyways, for the purpose of illustration, oh, it's about five cents a pound for wool labor or 45 cents per head to have those people pushing them up in the chute for that day, okay? So that's a pretty baseline estimate there as well. When we trade our wool to the person that cores it and measures and tells us the quality, and they hang on to it to set, find buyers domestically or internationally, that's about 15 cents a pound or $1.35. So right now, for the most part, give or take a couple of bucks, producers are making about $11.66 for that headache of shearing wool, shearing their sheep, okay? Now, it's not all that straightforward. Let's talk about the lower quality wool clips, okay? This shows just historic uh, from 2007 data, uh, 18 micron, again, I know we're here, sheep producer, but we're really educating ourselves today. Uh, 18 micron is probably some of the finest wool that we produce here in the U.S. That's the stuff that goes into really high-end socks and base layers. On the other end of the spectrum is our carpet wool type microns, 30 micron, okay? Uh, some of our black face sheep are producing 29, 30 and, and coarser wool, all right? I know it's really hard to see all these prices, but generally speaking, the higher the micron, the lower the price. So let's take into account that scenario that I just showed you with those costs of wool, 
So is it profitable for firewood producers to still be producing wool? Well, I took those estimates. On the high end of the spectrum, if you're producing the finest wool in our country right now and you're selling on the commodity market, you're making about $22.80. If you're producing something closer to maybe a coarser Rambouillet or a finer Columbia, you're looking at $11.66. But here's what you should all be paying attention to. And this is not to take anything away from our coarse wool sheep breeders, um, but those producing a 26 micron or coarser, they're probably only netting about three bucks per year right now. Okay, so when we speak in the context of, well, wool just isn't worth it. If we're talking about hard numbers, it is still worth it for some people in our region to produce wool. If they have the volume, they have the shears, perhaps they're value adding, it still works. For those 26 micron producers, not so much, okay? So this is mostly to educate our talking points, right? Because my, my hair sheep guys that I know in my state, I, I got to meet one today and I'm grateful for that, Ray. Uh, he gave me a hard time a little for not seeing him, but we're going to see more of him. I think it's important that we understand that when we talk about the merits of our breed, we don't, we don't use straw men arguments or, or false talking points, right? Everything is nuanced in the sheep business. So let me tell you a little bit about what I know about Katahdin production dynamics in Wyoming. Um, we hosted a field day a month ago in the Powell area, which is uh, northwest Wyoming, uh, one of the larger farming areas in our state. Uh, we hosted a field day at a 400 head Katahdin producers operation where we talked about parasite control, mineral programs, broader sheep management strategies. We had wool sheep guys there, we had hair sheep guys there. And since that meeting, I've been in preparation of this meeting, of course, I've been asking some of the productivity measures and asking these producers why they're raising Katahdin sheep in Wyoming. And I think this is important for us to know why we are raising the breed we're raising for economic reasons, for lifestyle reasons, whatever they may be, I think it's important that we take time to define that. So these two Katahdin breeders work pretty closely together, very much a commercial enterprise, um, not, not utilizing a whole lot of NSIP or breeding values, just this is where they're at. So both of these flocks are running on predominantly irrigated pasture and intensively managed uh, rotation system. Um, the one has been added a little bit more. He shed lambs some, he pasture lambs some, and he's producing about 160% weaning percentage. Now, this is based off their records, but this is what I was told. The other flock, again, similar management is expanding. He has a higher proportion of ewe lambs in his flock. So his lambing percentage is a little bit lower as one might expect at 140%. The only range producer I know that's running in a traditional range type management system and I don't, don't string me up at my toes for saying Dorper in here, okay? Again, we've, we've got that out of the table. We're not being breed evangelists. We're just talking cheap, okay? Uh, he runs a Dorper hair flock, but he, he's bought some Katahdin rams. He's bought some Katahdin ewe flocks, and he's lumping them into a larger management system. He runs these Dorper hair cross ewes like a traditional range system. He range lambs everything. Um, he's only producing 102% weaning crop because he is range lambing, he does some night penning, but predator issues in the areas that he's running are just challenging. But that's his level of production. But again, I'm going back to, if we were to do a poll in here, what is your level of production? What do you think it takes for your breed to excel in a, in a region that, that is historically known for producing wool sheep breeds? And I think it goes back to being willing to look at some of those strengths and weaknesses. Now, I, Again, because I'm the extension guy, some of our, our great scientists in here like to give us a hard time that we get too good old boy anecdotal sometimes, but I'm going to lean into that for a sec, okay? Um, in, in working with producers and having done some work with hair sheep, I think some of the merits uh, of, of hair sheep are definitely their aseasonality. I think breeding out of season is, is a strength. I think breeding of ewe lambs could be exploited a little bit more overall in our region, but that could be something produced. I think one of the greatest strengths that you all have that I hope you're all utilizing is our quantitative selection strategies through NSIP. I mean, arguably the Katahdin breed has been all in on quantitative genetics, generating EBVs, using EBVs or those estimated breeding values to make selection decisions. If you're a Katahdin breeder, this is where I will be prescriptive and you are not using that, you are underutilizing a major strength of your breed. Whereas some of our, our wool producers, we have struggled to get that technology embraced as an industry, which has been definitely a stumbling block. You don't have to wait for it. 
I'll give you one example. My colleague, Dr. Murphy from US Mark, last year they had a good production sale and we were talking a little bit about some of the different uh, indexed rams that were being offered for sale at US Mark. And I, I anxiously called him after the sale. I said, how'd you do? And he was kind of disappointed. I said, well, we just didn't have a lot of buyers there. I said, are you kidding me? You had some of the best ranked rams numerically, probably in the country because they've been buying Katahdin rams from all over the place. He said, yeah, that, that one went down the road to a commercial producer. Now, that's great, right? A commercial producer got great genetics, but wouldn't it have been great if, if Katahdin breeders had the ability to go there and actually buy that ram, uh, link his progeny throughout those various flocks? I mean, it just, I think it illustrates that sometimes we don't appreciate what we have. And I think that's something that you should keep in mind as you do this. Low input, no shearing. Again, notice that I said, didn't say wool is not worth anything because that's not true. But if wool is a real challenge in your area that it no longer is worth that 20 to $3 a, a head extra revenue, then don't do it, don't raise it. And Dr. Taylor is gonna talk about that some more. I, I really like the udders and this is very anecdotal because I know we have extremes across our breeds but I think maternally in the udder structure that I've seen in some of these hair use as I've, I've traveled and looked at some of them, I think it's pretty excellent. Uh, definitely excellent udder structure. And I think right now it does feel a very small flock niche opportunity. And that is not to deprecate or take anything away from the growers in the room here. You saw 70% of our industry roughly is from a small flock. And that's an important industry. I think some of these challenges that I'm gonna talk about here in a minute, um, again, this is according to my opinion, but as I work with the commercial sheep industry, I think these are some real opportunities to improve. And I'm gonna show you some carcass data in a minute. One of the things that I really like, and this is gonna be a soapbox, but I really think your use size is probably more in line with what our scarce range resources can, can afford sometimes. I, I talked to some folks earlier that we have some ewes in the Catan breed that are a little bigger, but more or less, I put this together just based off of NRC estimates. And what I did is the blue bar there represents 157 pound ewe, or what I refer to as a moderate sized ewe. I wish we had more 157 pound ewes in the Western sheep industry, at least Wyoming. We have got some massive ewes. And that, that orange bar right there represents some of the large ewes, uh, what that ewe would consume at these various time points as a percent of her body weight. So the first areas that we start with are maintenance and breeding. And I'm just assuming uh, a pasture lease cost where it comes out to about $3 per pound of, of dry matter for that grazing area. You can see that there's not a lot of difference between that smaller sized ewe and a larger sized ewe during maintenance and breeding, okay? Up above that, I put in terms of cents per day, that moderate ewe at maintenance, she's eating about eight cents per day at the cost. Uh, that large ewe is eating about nine cents. And again, these are based off of estimates from the NRC as a percent of their body weight. But what I really just wanna get at is we really start seeing some differences um, in terms of our input costs and maintenance requirements, in terms of how much feed those animals need to maintain themselves, once we get into those more highly demanding physiological stages, like late gestation and early lactation. I think something that, that with the help of the data that you have as a breed through your, your NSIP values, you can select through some of the indices that have been established to, to produce sheep that are a little bit more profitable. I think in our, in the larger industry, in the range industry, uh, we have still selected on, I like a big tall U that's gonna do well, right? Which that's not always the case. That U, you can see she's eating a lot more during those demanding time points. If she is not producing to make up for those added costs, she is not making us a lot of money, okay? And so this isn't necessarily a Katahdin wool sheep comparison here, this is theoretical. But we do know that larger sheep for the most part, unless they've been selected for feed efficiency for decades, we usually, a large animal eats more. And I think those large ewes have to be able to produce accordingly. Similarly, if we talk about mineral requirements, that's not gonna represent a huge cost on your enterprise. But I think um, right here, we did, we did a study recently where we, we looked at contemporary levels of production from USDA data, Dr. Taylor, Dr. Murphy, uh, Dr. Skast at University of Wyoming, we looked at historic changes in our phenotypes of, of breeds, okay? And we went back and we calculated, just for example's sake, zinc requirements. When we calculate our mineral requirements when we're working with mineral nutrition, we account for all those different stages of production and they basically add up. So 
You can see here these different colored bars. You know, we have a maintenance requirement for zinc, right? Based off of their body weight primarily. Then how fast they gain, we add a little bit more zinc to how much they need to get in their diet. You know, if they're producing wool, there's a big jump in zinc requirements because zinc is a, a major constituent of wool. And then we look at pregnancy and what is the litter weight? And, and all that adds up to tell us how much mineral does an animal need? We can see the Catan breed here, a large reason why its requirements are comparatively lower than some of our other breeds are because they have a nice moderate body size. Uh, their, their fetal weight at, at, at birth is, is pretty equivalent to some of those other breeds, but they also don't produce a fiber. So there is some advantages in terms of what they require. They don't require as, as robust a mineral package as some of our wool sheep because they're, they're producing different specialties, I'd say. So I think there's some advantages there. That may be a strength that you might want to think about is, is if we're producing a moderate productive view, there are some cost advantages there. There's a greater advantage if you're pretty sure she's weaning, you know, 150% of her body weight in lambs. But then that goes back to NSIP. Let's talk about some of the carcass traits and this will open up a whole can of worms, but I'm gonna be yanked off the stage here in a sec anyways. That's about a shepherd's crook. Uh, so you may think I have something against big sheep. I don't have anything against big sheep, but I think our exhibition and show industry has probably pushed us in that realm a lot more. I think big sheep can be advantageous if we're producing that in lean lamb. So don't let me criticize that too much, but historically we can see that annually, and I've only taken from 1986, uh, my graduate student Jalen Whaley, who worked on a, uh, a US lamb quality audit and a cost of fat survey in the industry, uh, put this together for me. But in 1986, our, our fat lamb was about 117 pounds before it was ready to go, okay? Fast forward to 2018, 2019, and this, I think this is conservative, but now the average fat lamb looks at like 135 pounds before it goes to slaughter. And this is based off of USDA data. This is not, this is not gospel according to it right here. But when we think about what kind of carcass those various fat lambs are gonna produce, these red lines represent some of the studies that, that I've been able to find that have been uh, recommended to me and that we have collected some carcass data on recently uh, with the US mark uh, through Tom Murphy and Dr. Frecking. But you can see that this right here represents the carcass weight from 1986 to 2018. And those red lines really kind of illustrate where some of your breed is producing right now. Now, admittedly, there's probably gonna be some more detailed carcass data presented. This first line up there where it says the mean hot carcass weight being 67.2 pounds. This was done from some of the meat scientists group at US Mark crossing Katahdin rams on Easy Care. How many of you have heard of those Easy Care composites, okay? That was the data set on that kind of crossbred lamb, okay? Um, the one thing I will say, and, and I'd like some more clarification and I, maybe Dr. Murphy can provide that later. These were, were age adjusted. And so I think the 67 pound hot carcass weight doesn't necessarily give us a great snapshot of what the average carcass weight will be under various feeding regimes in the Katahdin breed. This lower estimate right here represented the mean hot carcass weight from 116 weathers that my colleague, Dr. Cody Gifford, meat scientist at University of Wyoming uh, has collected. And um, the range that we observed in animals fed under similar management was 36 pound carcass weight up to a 75 pound carcass weight. Now, many of us may wanna say, yeah, yeah, that's great. I'm cheering for the 75 pound carcass weight because that's gonna make the packer a little bit more money. But that kind of variation, and admittedly in a very diverse set of uh, genetics represented from US Mark, that variation can limit our ability to enter a versatile commodity and niche marketing system. If we're only producing a 35 pound carcass, um, we are not getting much, hopefully, we are, not, we are not achieving what we possibly could under different management strategies. And I'll talk a little bit more about what the packer, I, I called and visited with some former students and plant managers and large packing plants in the Intermountain West, just to get their take on what their perception of the Catan breed is. And I'll share that in one second. But one more slide. Again, um, this represents some of the terminal sire breed evaluations done here at the US Sheep Experiment Station. Uh, published in 2012. Uh, this, the first column there, Murphy Gifford Stewart, that is from the first year of data collection on those carcass uh, 
those carcasses that we've collected down in Denver. And then the Whaley et al. 2020 was a study that we did surveying carcass traits in the US West at these large packing plants. And I guess for, for the sake of contrast, I don't think there's anything very noteworthy in Loina area, which to me was really interesting as I looked at this a little bit. Now, this is not an exhaustive list, and I'm sure some of our presenters later will give us a little bit more detail there. But what I wanna point out is um, really comparing that first study where we had that mean carcass weight of 55.7 pounds compared to what our industry survey found was closer to a 90 pound carcass average. You can see that there's a dichotomy there of, of carcass weights. <laughs> that is a lot of variation. I could have showed you yield grades and some of the 12 fat, 12th rib fat measurements and body wall thickness, but that would have just, uh, I think, told a, a more confusing story. The reality is, is that we are producing a unique breed. I say we, you are producing a unique breed that has unique strengths that should be championed. But if you're producing katahdins in volume, generally speaking, we probably should be thinking about what the criteria of our packers is to some extent. Now, if we're only marketing 20 lambs a year, I think we can peddle those in different places and we're fine, right? The ethnic market will take those all day. But if you ask that range producer who's raising 2,000 head, it is really hard for him to justify taking loads of 50 to the local sale barn and trying to make it work. We have to have some criteria as a breed. Uh, we, you have to have some criteria as a breed that says, you know, we're shooting for this benchmark. We shouldn't be producing 35 pound carcasses on 100 pound lambs. Whatever that may be, I think defining it moving forward is gonna be more important than anything. Just a couple more anecdotes from the Packers. Uh, again, um, traditionally, as I talked with two of these uh, different Packers and, and they asked that I just not mention their names. We don't have many Packers left in the industry, so you probably don't have to think about that. Um, but I appreciate their, their candid input because we don't get enough communication sometimes with our industry segments. And that is another talk for another time, but that inherent distrust and that inherent lack of communication and transparency is gonna to continue to, to be a challenge. But they said, we don't get a lot of hair sheep. Okay, that was fine. But they said, we don't have any real quality concerns with these. They said, unfortunately, we don't fabricate these 50 pound carcasses. These are going to what we refer to as the carcass trade. So they will kill those lambs, take that whole carcass and send it to various fabrication outlets or, or butchers that will, will primal out those carcasses and do different things with it. There are two variables is what they said. The carcasses are too variable in size and too light in size to be ready for what they refer to as that case ready, fresh American lamb product that's ready to go into the retail shelf, okay? Their range, and again, this was very subjective. One said 60, the other one said 65. But for case of illustration here, for, a, for, for the most part, for those to fit a case ready application at the packing side, that 65 to 80 pound carcass is what's required, okay? Now it's a 60 to, 65 to 80 pound carcass, it's a yield grade two and three. And again, yield grade, again, going back to Meat Science 101, that's a calculation based off of back fat, okay? That is one challenge that I think we have that I'll talk about here in a second is that it is, it can be challenging for us to achieve that carcass weight range without depositing excess fat. But they asked me, they said, do you think the Katahdin can consistently produce a 65 pound carcass? Because if they could, we'd buy more of them, is what they said. Now I'd say, take that with a grain of salt. Are you, are you changing and overhauling your breed objectives based off of the opinion of one or two packers? I hope not. If your whole marketing system is based on a very profitable ethnic marketing system where the lighter weight carcasses are working, don't change it. But just know a larger range breed, if it is a larger range breed, we probably have to be paying attention to those specs. This is some older data that, that was generated ooh, many years ago. And Dr. Dr. Nader, you might be familiar with this. Um, it, just predicting lamb harvest weight based off of the mature body size of the, the dam and the sire. But I, I just provide this as contrast. Um, again, this, this old prediction model may not fit for hair sheep, it probably needs to be updated. And I think we've had some discussions to do that with some of our USDA collaborators. Uh, but basically it takes the sire breed mature weight plus the ewe breed mature weight divided by two times 0.65. And for many of the wool breeds, that was a very, it was a good tool to kind of estimate when those, rams, those lambs were ready to go to harvest, okay? 
And I'm not claiming that that's the best, but I'm contrasting two of those scenarios using those calculations. The first being a target slaughter weight for a Katahdin lamb. And I, I admittedly didn't use probably the most robust estimates of what the mature body weight of a Katahdin ram is versus the mature weight of a ewe. But for the most part, I said 180 pound ram, 120 pound uh, ewe, which is like from what I heard from some of these, uh, some of the producers here today, that's looking at a target slaughter weight of about 97.5 pounds, okay? At a 51% yield, we are nowhere close to that 60 pound carcass weight that's for the case ready endpoint, okay? You can see it's a different paradigm entirely with a, with a larger frame Suffolk maternal si or terminal sire with a, a large frame range Ramble AU. You can see that that target slaughter weight's closer to 150 pound for that crossbred lamb. Which brings me to my last point. If we are going to gain entry into a larger industry, we have to have some good breed specific recommendations. I don't want to sound cynical, but right now as an industry, we have a real hard time killing lambs on time, especially killing them according to their genotypic uh, preference. So for example, when we get the majority of the feedlot full of those Suffolk Rambouillet cross lambs, we know we can kind of manage them all the same and kill them at the same time. But if we get a bunch of thin sheep crossed with the Suffolk ram, they're gonna kill a lot lighter. And when those feedlots feed them to the same weight, we have an overfat carcass problem on our hands. And so I think future work that as an organization you can help delineate is working with, working with your research collaborators at the university and ARS to really get some better recommendations to how these types of sheep should be managed from a feeding perspective. Again, this just goes back to the table that was generated uh, by Dr. Thomas at the University of Wisconsin at these various breed types. Again, you've got the U breed mature weight on that vertical column there, the sire breed mature weight, and that kind of shaded area represents what size live weight that lamb will be for it to hit a yield grade two carcass based off of the size of its parents. There's other ways of doing this. Uh, this is based off prediction equations that we have to know what the Katahdin breed is doing. But for the most part, uh, this is something that I see as a glaring hole as we try to get these packers or these feedlots to buy our hair lambs. It's, it's educating them that they don't feed the same way. It's also utilizing terminal sires. And again, think about the, Ken or the Sammy Kershaw slide I presented earlier. Don't ever want to say anything bad about a breed, but crossbreeding is a beautiful, beautiful thing. Okay. And finding some good terminal sires, if you are producing lamb, and you breed a proportion of your flock or your older ewes to those terminal sires and you produce massive growthy lambs that are going to do well on the rail, that is a way of, of achieving those carcass goals without overhauling the direction of your breed. So I'll leave you with these thoughts. I think challenging these paradigms and what you're going to hear the rest of this meeting is just that. I think we don't grow unless we're forced to look closely at ourselves, right? And the same is true from a breed perspective. But I think we have to be willing to know what our operation is and what we're after. Too often, I'm gonna get in trouble because this is on the web. Too often I've gone to industry meetings where we have one perspective on a, in, on a panel answering questions saying, this is what you ought to do. And I'm always blown away as I listen to producers they're like, didn't you hear? That's what, that's what we need to do. We're going to do that. It's like, well, why are they telling you to do that? Well, in the case of a processor, a lot of heavyweight carcasses is where they're going to make their money, okay? Or they're trying to line up supply. Same thing with if, you're, if someone on a panel is selling you rams, chances are there may be some strings attached to the information that they're, sent, they're sharing. Is, is, is that safe to assume? Why don't we ask those questions in those, those moments? I'm always baffled by it. Um, I will just reiterate that it is not us versus them. And throughout the course of this, this breed association meeting, we have got to evolve beyond, oh, well, those are wool sheep people and I don't like the wool sheep, and those are hair sheep people and I don't like the hair sheep people. We are producing a high quality animal protein here. And we may have been disrespected in previous years you know, by, by a certain type of producer, but let's move on beyond that. And let's work together with those existing industry organizations. We had an incident recently with the Wyoming wool growers, which is my industry group, okay? I appreciate them. They got me hired. They continue to help me with programming to reach producers. But I had a producer say, well, 
I will join the Wyoming wool growers when they change to the Wyoming sheep growers. I'm saying, yeah, they probably should maybe change eventually. But the reality is, is they are our industry group, our representative with ASI, our, my industry group that keeps me able to share information at the university level. Why wouldn't we have a seat at the table? And that's the last challenge. I think you've got to have a seat at the table. As uncomfortable or as frustrating as it may be, if you don't have a seat at the table in your industry organization, we're fragmenting our industry. And that, that is a high opinion to go on to end this talk, but stay engaged, stay engaged as an institution or as an organization with your, your land grant university, but also your USDA collaborators. Brett wouldn't say this, but, but our USDA colleagues, they don't get a lot of, um, they don't get a lot of incentive to do outreach to their producers. They do it because they care about the industry. They're in the research realm, but what they're doing today and what they're presenting today is because they truly care about the industry. If we don't stay engaged with those research resources, we're losing infrastructure in an industry which ultimately is gonna damage us. So I challenge you all with that. Um, hopefully I've, I've created enough controversy that my, my colleagues that are gonna speak are gonna have lots of questions later. So that's all I got. 